are also graced by uh, Ashley Davis. How are you, Ashley? Good, thanks. How are you, Kevin? Not too bad. Not too bad. Thank you very much for jumping in with this talk. How to start your own open source project, and I hear you're going to be open sourcing something tonight. Yep. Yeah, well, technically, it's already open source, but I will publish it on NPM tonight. Published. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> Technicality that I missed that. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Well, uh, cool. I'll get out of your way and I'll let you uh, take over. Thanks very much, Ashley. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Andre. That was a really cool talk as well. I'm, uh, I'm going to put uh, case six on my list of things to investigate. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Davis. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm the author of Bootstrapping Microservices. Uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, I will be talking about microservices here on Briz, at BrizJS next month. Uh, so I'll be talking about Node.js and microservices, and I'll be giving away some copies of my book. So please join us again next month for that talk. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about how to open source your own uh, project with uh, a focus, obviously, on JavaScript and Node.js. <laughs> Now, a bit of background, um, I, I, I was just literally just last week, you know, starting a, a simple open source project. It, it's really tiny, tiny, it's really small. It's a bit of an experiment, a bit of a prototype for me, but it's already useful. So I've already kind of obviously got it on GitHub. Um, but uh, it, it occurred to me that not everyone necessarily knows how to start an open source project. Um, and, uh, and that I could, you know, maybe provide some help and some instruction on how to get started with one, uh, one of your own. Now, you might say, like, why have a talk on this? Like, isn't it just as simple as sticking it on GitHub? Um, and in a sense, yeah, it is that simple. Um, but, I, you know, I'd say also it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And um, I just want to go through some of the stuff tonight and, you know, just tell you how to make the best go of it and, and how to present yourself uh, to, you know, how to present your code in such a way that it presents you in the best possible light. <clears throat> and uh, I'm also going to give a demo. Obviously, I'm going to demo how to make a new project uh, how to put it on GitHub, and I'm also going to, you know, we're going to have a look at my new open source project, which is really small, it's really tiny, so nothing, nothing to get too excited about, uh, but uh, it's already on GitHub, but we're going to have a look at the structure of that, what I've done there, and uh, I'm going to publish it on NPM, hopefully, tonight, uh, if, the, if, the, if the demo gods let us. <clears throat> All right, I'll just uh, share my screen so you can see my slides. <clears throat> So um, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me later and have a chat about any of the sort of stuff that I'm talking about. Uh, you can see my contact details on each slide. Cool. So before we get into it, I mean, let's just define what I mean by open source. And I'm sure everyone knows this, but you know, let's, let's just make it, let's just get it out there in the open. And typically um, it's a coding project whose source code is public. You know, the code is made available for anyone to look at and um, you can even take a copy of you know, any code that's open source, you can take a copy of that yourself and you can, um, you can make your own changes to it, which is really useful. It's really empowered a, a whole generation of developers really and, and really, really changed our uh, industry as far as I can tell. And of course, um, when you make changes to someone else's open source code, you can, you know, as they say, submit a pull request, which basically requests that your contribution be taken into the actual kind of main line of the code and, you know, become that official kind of version of that code. And uh, that's always fun to do. So some examples of open source that you probably know, I, I would hope you had heard of these, obviously Linux, um, you know, Kubernetes, which is uh, something that I use for, for deploying my, uh, my, my backends, and Node.js, which is uh, the runtime that runs JavaScript in the backend. Now, like, you know, th these, these projects, are, like if it wasn't for these projects, like I wouldn't have the career that I have now. So it, it's, it, they, they really did these, these products, like it, in the lifetime of my career, they have changed the course of my career and it wouldn't have been possible without open source. Now, here's the thing, right? It can be great to contribute to a big open source project, um, but it can also be very daunting, if, especially if you don't have much experience as a developer or if you're new to open source, it can be very daunting to commit to or to um, contribute to a big project. You know, they, they tend to have these um, contribution rules that can, that can unfortunately, I mean, you know, that we, we do have to have rules to make sure everyone plays nice in these big projects, but, you know, they, they can really alienate new developers. <clears throat> and also the project that you might want to make or the project that you've got a, a burning desire that you want to create, it might not even exist. 
So you might have to start it yourself from scratch um, if you want to get it off the ground. So we're not we're not talking about uh, today. We're not talking about how to commit or how to how to start contributing to one of these big projects or how to how to generally get involved in open source. You know, there's plenty of blog posts out there on how to do that. I'm literally talking about how to start your own project from scratch. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate. So my new open source library is called Fidget. And, uh, and I've literally only just started it last week and there's not much there. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to publish that on NPM tonight. Uh, before we get into it, let, let's look at some reasons why it's good to contribute to open source. Uh, and hopefully I, can, uh, hopefully I can convince you, if you're not already convinced, that it's worthwhile. Uh, first of all, it's a great way to get some experience, and that's really important if you're a new developer, you know, looking to break into the industry, and you need to find a way to stand out against all the other people that are kind of going to be interviewing for the same jobs that you're going to be interviewing for. Um, having your name on an open source project um, is also a good way to get noticed, um, especially if the project comes popular, um, or, or you know, if you do end up contributing to a large project, you know, that's a good way to get noticed. It's good for your CV, obviously, like if you're, if you're a new developer, you don't have much experience to list on your CV, um, open source coding is a great place to start to get that CV, that, that experience that you can put on your CV. Uh, it's, also, it's also very, very satisfying to be able to um, contribute to the community. Um, you know, and this is especially if you use open source, uh, and if you've you know, if you've had a great benefit from open source in your career like I have, you want to kind of repay the favour. And it feels good to be able to kind of give code back to the community. Um, in that vein, it's also, it's also simply nice to be part of a community because, you know, coding like so many other things is, is, well, at least it can be, a very social activity. And it's nice to be in a community working with other people and to be able to have interactions with those people. Now, obviously, you're not going to get that straight away if you're starting your own project. Um, but you, you know, you can go to one of the big projects for that, or, you know, if you're lucky, your own project that you're starting could become a big success. You could attract, uh, you know, it, it could attract its own community. You could build your own community around your own project. And um, lastly, you might want to do open source coding simply because you love coding. I mean, that, that's a good enough reason for me. Um, I'm doing coding all the time anyway. Like I do it, uh, unfortunately, I do it for work and I do it as my hobby. Uh, like when I do coding on the side, I'm not being paid for it or anything like that. Um, you know, I'm often just doing it for fun, learning or to solve a problem that I've got. You know, I may as well be doing that kind of coding um, in the open for all the other benefits that I've, I've just outlined. <clears throat> so why start your own project in particular? Now, I've already mentioned that established projects can be pretty hard to get into. You know, they can be a huge overwhelming code base. Um, that in itself, you know, it, it can be very hard to get into a big new code base and feel comfortable with that. That, that can take a long time. But when you start your own project, obviously, you know, it's easy. You're starting like with one line of code probably. So, you know, it, it's not big. It's, it's very manageable for you. Um, and, you know, if it feels like there's any barriers to contributing to these large uh, open source projects, you know, don't let that be an excuse not to do open source coding because, you know, it, it is just so easy to start your own project. <clears throat> uh, another reason to start your own project is because the thing that you want to create doesn't exist yet. And if that's the case, you know, and you have a burning desire to build something, um, then you might just have to start it yourself. That, you know, there might not be a project out there that does what you want, you know, for you to go and work on. You know, or maybe you just want to re-implement someone else's idea because you think you can do it better, um, differently, uh, or you want it done in some other way. You, you, you might remember if you were watching Briss last year, you might remember I did a talk called um, like, you know, when to reinvent the wheel or something or something like that it was called. And I, and I talked about that kind of thing. It's like, like when it's okay to kind of, you know, to rebuild something that's already been done, you know, when you, when you want to do that, um, you know, and it's for your own learning or you need, you need it done in another way. Um, as long as you have the right motivations and you have realistic expectations about, you know, what, what's going to come from that. Um, you know, it's a good, as good as excuse as any to, to kind of start your own open source project. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is important. Before embarking on your own open source project, I want you to commit to presenting the best possible version of yourself. Your code and documentation are going to be on display for the world to see. 
So to the best of your ability, you, you need to make sure it's the best code and documentation that you can muster. And you have to make your best effort to make your code user-friendly as well so other people can use it. I mean, so many people just voice their code on the world with, and, you know, you try and use it and it's full of holes and, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to understand without reading the code how to use it. You know, you, you can make a really good effort to provide, you know, good error messages, good documentation so that, um, you know, people don't have trouble using your code. But please don't use this as an excuse to procrastinate. You know, don't let this put you off. Uh, imperfect and out there is better than never sees the light of day. So um, just remember that you can refine your code as you learn, and there is a broad, a broad spectrum of what makes code good or bad. So just don't be afraid to get your code out there. It doesn't have to be perfect, um, but you know, over time you can strive for it to be the best code that, that you've ever done. <clears throat> so these are the steps for starting a new open source project. And I'm going to go through these in the demo in a moment, but I'll just, I'll just run them through them quickly first and explain. Uh, first, the first step is very important. You've got to choose a cool name. <laughs> Actually, you know, don't, don't spend too long deliberating on this. Um, you can always change the name later. And, uh, and I'll show you, I'll show you uh, how to check if the name's available. I'll show you how to check that in a moment. <clears throat> then you create your project, obviously. Uh, I'm going to be showing you soon how to create uh, a Node.js project from scratch. Uh, then create a code repository for your project. Initially, this is just a local code repository. It's not something that's on GitHub yet. It doesn't need to go on GitHub straight away. Um, you, you can hold off. And um, you can do some initial iterations of coding um, before, you put it, uh, before you make it open source and put it on GitHub. But I say, don't, don't wait too long. Um, you need to commit to getting your code out there in the open. And you know, that can be hard the first time. Uh, the first time you're trying to make your code public and you're not sure whether how it's going to reflect on you, that can be hard. But I say just do it. Um, just get it out there, even if it's not perfect yet. Um, so after you've done some local iterations of coding, um, you're going to create um, your GitHub repository for it, for the code, for the project, and then you'll push your code to that GitHub repository. Congratulations, you've got an open source code project. Now, at this point, you know, you may want to do some iterations to tidy up the code. Uh, make sure it's well tested and, you know, make sure that maybe you have some small and appropriate amount of documentation online in the form of a readme. I'll show you an example of readme in a moment. So your code is public now. And, um, you know, say if you're going for a job, you know, a potential employer is going to look at this and they're going to see it and you want it to paint you in a positive light. So that's really important. And uh, now it's just more iterations of coding, more refinement, you know, more adding of whatever features you want to add you know, fixing whatever bugs come up. And uh, when you are happy with it, you can publish it. So, you know, once you've got it to that level where, you know, you, you want to make an official release, um, you can publish it. Um, and uh, for us, you know, we're going to be working with Node.js and uh, JavaScript, so we're going to publish it on NPM. So you can also publish uh, releases on GitHub if you like. Um, and if you're, obviously, if you're using a different language, you know, you, you publish it wherever that you know, wherever the package manager for that language is. Okay, so uh, now, now is the bit we've all been waiting for, a live demo. Uh, please start praying to the demo gods for me, and uh, we hope this is going to work out. <laughs> Let me just find my command prompt. Uh, oh, let, let's all, let's, let's look for a name. So uh, I'm just going to go to npm. And uh, actually, initially, I wanted to call my, um, my my little open source project is all about configuration. So I wanted to call it Figgy, but unfortunately, um, that name was taken. So I just did a search on NPM to see what was what was taken, and then I had to kind of I had to rename it. So I, I came up with Fidget, and Fidget isn't there yet. So unless someone nicks it from me in the in the next few minutes, um, <laughs> hopefully they won't. <laughs> Nobody do that, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I'll name it something else. I don't, I don't honestly don't care. You trolls. <laughs> okay, so I mean the first thing you want to do when you're making a, a like a Node.js project, obviously, is to create the project itself. So I'm just gonna make a directory called demo, go down to that. I'm just working on the Windows here, but you'll you see I've got a bunch of Linux commands, and that's just because I've got you know git bash installed. And I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty com uh, confident with Linux commands, so I tend to use them a lot. Okay, so there's nothing here yet. There's nothing in this directory yet. But if I do an npm init to create my initial project, 
uh, with dash Y, basically, which uh, uh, you non-interactively, you know, fills out all the questions, things that you want to go, go back and kind of fill out later before you publish this. But that just gives you your package.json file, right? So I can start this in Visual Studio Code now. I've got a package file here. Uh, so this tells it tells you what the main file is. I'm just going to create that. I'm just going to create a main file with XJS. And uh, this is the Hello World package. It's, uh, it's going to be a very important open source code project one day. So, you know, nothing too exciting here, but, you know, you want to do a little bit of coding and, you know, um, you know check that you can run this, check that it works. Um, the, the first step um, after you've created it, oh, so I, I just created a JavaScript project from, from scratch here, but I actually usually normally work with TypeScript, which is a little bit more difficult setup. And I have a template for that that I can show you here. You can find it. So if you're interested in TypeScript, uh, on my GitHub, Ashley Davis TypeScript template, um, I, I generally just copy this project, this whole project, and I, I do a find and replace on TypeScript template to whatever I want to call it. This is how the fidget project started, for instance. <coughs> um, so if you if you have a you know particular, if you do open source projects quite frequently like I do, um, it's good to have a little template to start from that, you know, uh, there's not much boilerplate. If it's just pure JavaScript, there's not much boilerplate. You don't need a template really. Um, so what I'm going to do here in my demo project is I'm just going to do a git init to start a fresh um, git repository there. I can look at git status and I can see the files that I've got uh, ready to, to be committed here. I'm just going to add all of those. I'll get all this in a oh, sorry, git add dot. Commit them. You want to have a more imaginative commit message if this was a real project. Um, so I've just created my local Git repo. So I could do something like, um, you know, hello computer, change that. And you see, like I'm doing some local iterations uh, of, of coding here, having a look at what I've done, make sure it works, everything like that. So that's it. That's my local repository. Um, oh, I want to create, probably want to create a, I, I don't have any dependencies yet, but I'll just show you this. I will uh, install uh, DayJS, which is uh, a nice little um, date manipulation library for JavaScript that's um, compatible, mostly compatible with Moment.js, but a lot less bloated. So let's say I want to do some date manipulation in, in this project. You know, I get that in. I, I'm installing this dependency. It's going to be part of the package file now. We can see that if we look at the package file. So you can see my DayJS install is there. <laughs> now, uh, if I look at the status, uh, you can see that I've got the node modules directory. Like if, if I went and committed this now, um, I'd get all the node modules committed to Git as well. So we don't want those. Um, so, so one of the things you need pretty quickly is a Git ignore file. If you just type node modules in there, uh, hopefully this does what I think it's going to do. I spell that right. Slash. Oh yeah, so okay, so I've got the slash wrong. Uh, but you can see before we had node modules there. Now I do a git status, there is no node module. So I've excluded that node modules directory from the, the git repository. And now I can do another git add. Oh, you'll also notice I've got package JSON as well, which I'm just I'm just committing as well now. So that's a really important um, file to get in there into your into your code repository. So I've done, a, I've done a few iterations of local coding. Let's just pretend that this project does something useful, which it doesn't, but um, I will show you Fidget in a minute, which does something useful. <clears throat> and uh, let's just have a look at what the next thing is I want to show. Uh, that's cool. I, I, I do want to show you a readme as well, but I'll show you that. I'll show you that in Fidget in just a moment. I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to put this on GitHub. So, if I go to my, my account on GitHub, what I can do here is click on, I can find it behind, behind the Zoom window. I click on new repository. Can everyone, hopefully everyone can see that. Da, 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 let's call it demo. So good. Don't, don't add any of this stuff here. 
like if, if you want to kind of push up a local a local kind of git repo to an empty repo on github don't don't initialize it with anything just keep all that empty create your repository it gives you some instructions here i i, I always i never remember how to do this i always use these instructions it tells you that you've got to add your remote to your local repo so i'm just copying that over uh, suck your main branch and then push your your main branch to the origin I'm all set up with um, SSH authentication here as well, which means I, I can I can connect to GitHub and I can I can I can talk to GitHub from the command line without having to type in any passwords or anything like that. So I've pushed this project up to GitHub. If I refresh the page on GitHub, uh, if there was a README, which there isn't, you'd see it here. In fact, let's just add a quick README just to see what that looks like. So ideally, you want to read me uh, every project. Demo, you know, such a cool hello world program. You know, this 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 is this this project is bound to be a hit. I imagine I imagine that the first person who ever did the first hello world project had no had no clue how successful the hello world line of projects was going to be. Okay, so we we'll do git status again. You can see I've got a readme here. I'm going to add that git commit. Some docs. I'm just pushing that. So from now on, I can just use git push to get my code up onto GitHub. If anyone else makes changes, I can use uh, I can use git pull to bring those down. Uh, so we should refresh this now, and we should see that readme. So when you write a readme, it, like it appears on the front page of the project here on GitHub. It also appears on npm when you get to publishing it as well. And in fact, I'm just going to go through all the way, and I'm just going to I'm going to publish this demo on on npm, which should just be a step away now. So we might we might do some more iterations of coding on this before we want to publish the first version you definitely want to have a look at the package file we're going to have a look at a, a different package file for fidget in a moment that's more fleshed out and i'll explain it but let's just push through this for now um i'm just going to give it a real long name and hope that that doesn't already exist on npm um you know there's plenty of other stuff you want to look at here you probably want to look at the version number and make sure that's what you want it to be um i'm just glossing over all that for the moment um, and I've already authenticated with, with NPM. So um, if I didn't, I'd be doing NPM login and then I'd be typing in my username and my password for NPM. But seeing as I've already done that and I've already published stuff from this computer, I can just run NPM publish and fingers crossed this thing will be on NPM in a moment. <clears throat> cool. So I would show you that on NPM, but I want to get to fidget. We'll get fidget on NPM and then I'll show you that. But um, now if you do want to just get rid of this thing, like, I don't want to clutter up npm with you know this demo project, so I'm, I'm just going to unpublish it. Um, it's going to give me a, a bit of a warning to say that I need to use force. So I'm just going to force it there, and it's just going to say, "I hope you know what you're doing." <laughs> but I do. I don't. I didn't. I didn't want to put that demo project on there. Really, you know, it's people, it's people like me that are cluttering up npm with all sorts of weird projects. <clears throat> okay, so that that was just really quick, you know. Create an create a Node.js project. Um, do a little bit of coding. You know, create a Git repository. Do a little bit of coding. Um, create create the repository, uh, an empty repository on GitHub, and then push your project up, and then it's open source. You know, do a bit more coding, and then finally you're going to get to like you know version one or maybe a zero point one or something like that, and then you publish it on npm. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the Fidget project. I'll give you a bit of a demo first as well, just to show you what this does. Um, I've got it open already here somewhere. So this is like a real tiny little project um, that I've only tested on one thing, but it works. It works nicely, and, it, and it's got some features. It's got some potential features I want to add still, but it's only like this, like one function, right? <laughs> That's all there is to it. Like I made an open source project for this, but the reason is, is this is a command line tool for processing configuration in, information, and I hope to use this within my continuous delivery pipeline for uh, one of the projects that I'm working on. What it does is it basically takes a, a JavaScript configuration file. Here's my first example. So this is just like um, a normal JavaScript file that exports use, uh, and I just lost it. Hit the wrong hotkey and I lost my screen, there you go. Okay, so this is, um, we're, we're exporting an object here, right? And the object is configuration for a Kubernetes deployment. So normally you do this in YAML, 
what, what I wanted to do actually was something like this project I'll show you quickly. I discovered this project, um, JSONnet. Um, it looks pretty cool if you're into Python. What it is, it's like a data templating library where you kind of set up some data in, in Python and then uh, you, can fig you can figure the data however you want and then it spits out either you know, JSON or YAML or, or some, other, some other configuration format based on that. So it's like a data templating library. I wanted to make something like this, uh, but I wanted to be able to use it in JavaScript. <clears throat> so this code is JavaScript. You can have any JavaScript here. What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm reading in some environment variables. So this is the main reason I want this, right? Is I wanna, normally when you're trying to configure a Kubernetes deployment, um, you can't just kind of pipe environment variables into your configuration file. It all has to be hard coded, which is pretty ugly. So I wanted like a data templating language that I could use to kind of, you know, populate a configuration with some variables. And so far I'm just using some environment variables, just using standard JavaScript there. And I'm plugging those environment um, variables into my configuration. And then what the actual code for Fidget does is it literally just requires in that JavaScript file, come on, I'm on my old laptop, you see. <laughs> my, my new laptop isn't working properly at the moment and the hotkeys are all over the place. Anyway, so require in uh, your configuration, so you've got some data, and then depending on the um, command line options, you either output stringify to JSON and output that, um, or you stringify to YAML and output that. And so a quick, a quick demo of how this works from the command line. So this isn't published yet, so it's, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not running this like as a kind of globally installed command line tool yet. I hope to do that in a moment. So I'm running this first example. You can see I'm passing in the first example, and what it's spitting out is an expanded YAML file uh, with you know, my environment variables basically passed into it. So I, I could potentially use this configuration file for rolling out. I, I use this one configuration file for rolling out multiple microservices, but they're going to be templated by data. So I, I can have like one, you know, microservices with different names and images and stuff like that. Um, and that's what this little open source project does. Now, before I publish this, um, let's have a quick look at the README. So obviously you want to get a nicely fleshed out README. You can hit the preview button up here to kind of preview how it's going to look um, on the right here in Visual Studio Code. You know, this is, there's not much to it, but you know, there's instructions here on how to install it, um, how it's going to be run once, you know, once it's published and you can use like this uh, as a global command line option. Um, there's a trivial example, and then there's a more complicated example here. So just Nice bit of documentation that explains how to use this. Um, that's all written in the markdown format. You can preview how it's going to look uh, in Visual Studio Code like that. Look at the package file. Um, this, this package or this whole project is from my TypeScript template. And that's why, you know, there's a fair bit already in my package.json that just came from the template. And then I've installed, you know, a couple of dependencies on top of that, like the, like the library for, that kind of writes out the YAML file. Uh, now you can Google, you know, package.json, it'll give you, you know, what you need to kind of set this up, but just make sure you've got your name. That's what it's going to be published as on NPM. You've got your version. I usually like to start at, you know, 0 .0 0.0.1. That gives you a bit of scope to kind of, you know, change it before you get to version one so that you don't kind of set up any false expectations. Like, I mean, you don't, I'd, I'd love to keep backward compatible, of course, with, with older versions, but you know, just, just to set the, set the tone that this is sort of an experimental project and that maybe you, you don't want to depend on it until it gets to version one, say. A bit of a description. So the description will show up um, on NPM, I think. Uh, and then, you know, there's this other setup here that's specific to TypeScript. There's, setup, there's um, some setup here that's specific for it to be a command line tool. So we're going to run this from the command line. It's not um, like you could use it as an API. You could, you could just require it into another JavaScript um, code file and start using it as an, you know, like a, an API like that. But it's also, it's, it's really intended to be a command line tool that I'm going to run in my continuous delivery uh, pipeline. And um, there's a bunch of uh, links here that you want to get filled out um, to point to your repo, maybe your homepage, if you have a homepage for it, documentation, you know, where you go to report issues, things like that. Um, your email address, just make sure it's an email address that you're happy to go public. This is my public email address. Um, and I put that on all my kind of um, all my all my um, code repos and every, anything I publish to NPM. Um, make sure it's got an appropriate license. I I I've just been using traditionally using MIT for a long time, 
but it would default um, it would default to ISC if you just created this project from scratch. Um, and ISC is like a, a like a simplified version of MIT. I think I'm probably just going to start using ISC actually now that I think about it. So uh, that's about everything. Um, you can find Fidget um, on GitHub already. Let's have a look at that. Do I have it open here? Oh, yeah. It's hard to work around these Zoom controls sometimes. Um, should have had this open already. Where is it? Yeah, I'm not sure where I'm not sure where I put the reap over this, but um, oh, I had it actually had it in the package file, didn't I? How can I find it? What? You know, maybe I never actually open sources. this. Maybe I was actually waiting waiting to do it um, in this. So let, let's just try and do it now. Do the, can do the whole thing. Can officially open source this thing live on Chris.js. So type the name Fidget. I'm, make, I'm just making a new repo here, just the way I did before. I'm going to copy the description of this directly from here, from the from the package file. It's going to be public. That's cool. I'm not going to have any of that stuff. <clears throat> now I just copy these commands out so I can link my local code repo to my remote code repo on, on GitHub. Do that as quick as I can. In a moment, that should be on GitHub. Let's refresh this. So there we go. Fidget is online. You can see the README has kind of rendered nicely uh, on the main page of the project here. Um, if you want to take a look at that for yourself, look at my GitHub and look at the Fidget project. So that's it. So open sourced on, uh, on, on live TV, as it were. But I'm going to publish this on uh, NPM as well. So. Let's just see if uh, anyone's taken my name yet. <laughs> well, looking good. Let's uh, let's get this one off. Now, because this is a TypeScript project, it's actually going through a pre-build step. In fact, let's just have a look at that in the package.json file. So you've got this um, field here, pre-publish only. So what it's doing is an NPM test. Um, I don't think there's actually any automated tests on this. It's that simple. Um, it's cleaning the build directory and then it's running the TypeScript compiler. So it does all that before it's publishing it. And we've also got this um, NPM ignore file here as well. So this .NPM ignore file basically controls the things that aren't going to be published on NPM. So we don't, particularly here, we don't publish the node modules. Like that doesn't need to be published as part of this. Uh, and where is it? But we don't publish the source code. So the source code is TypeScript and you don't need that. So I'm actually built as part of the build process, I'm building the TypeScript code to JavaScript and then it's the JavaScript code that gets published. Let's see where it's at. Ah, something's failed. Ah, oh, my linting. I, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm just fed up with lint. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get rid of this pretest thing here with this got lint in it. Um, Sorry, sorry if you like lint, um, <laughs> anyone who's listening in and they actually like lint. Um, it, it tends to annoy me uh, more than I find value in it. I, I, I tend to find myself, if I use it, you know, commenting out rules for things that I think should be acceptable and I can never quite uh, agree with myself on, on a standard for linting. So this is just running through some tests, but like, like there's literally one kind of stub test in there from the template. It's not even doing anything, but if that test failed, like if there was actually a real automated test in there and that would fail, that would stop the publication process. So that's really important when you're working on an open source project. You don't want to kind of, and, and, and you're investing in automated testing, of course. Cool, that should be live now. Uh, it says here version 0 0.0.1. Let's just do a search. It, it does sometimes take NPM, the NPM registry, a little bit of time to catch up. Sometimes it's not into this, but look, there we go, cool, Fidget. So Fidget is on NPM. And I should be able to install that from there. Uh, using the instructions that I've given myself here. Let's see if I can do that. So 
So I'm just installing that globally. That looks good. I'm not going to go and test that. I'm just going to assume that that works. So I will have to test that later because you know it is it is possible to obviously publish broken code. Um, and I don't really have any real automated tests in there yet for this. So who knows what state it's actually in at the moment. Uh, that's it. That, that's it. That's uh, no open source project, uh, open sourced on GitHub, live on TV, and uh, and published to NPM. Um, fortunately, without without a hitch or without any any frowning from the demo gods. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. So um, the question is, what comes next? You've, you've started your open source project. What are you going to What are you going to do with it now? Ah, well, obviously, um, you know, just keep going, uh, keep plugging it away at it. You know, continue the project while it's useful to you, and uh, or continue the project while it's useful to the community. If you get traction with the community and people ask you to, to keep working on it, and that that's what you want to do, that's awesome. Um, you know, if you're done with it. Like, like if you decide to finish up and move on to something else, um, just put in a bit of extra time to wrap it up nicely so that there's no loose ends uh, and that it's a good reflection on you as a developer. Put in that extra time to make sure it looks good, basically, and then drop it, you know, move on to something else. There's no point continuing to beat away at a project, you know, that's past its use by date, you know. Like, just, just make sure it's, it's good, useful, uh, and that it's a good reflection on you. And then, you know, regardless of whether you drop it or keep going, just make sure that you tell people about it. You know, there's no point doing open source coding um, if you don't want to show your code to other people. You know, don't keep it to yourself. You know, shout it from the rooftops if you have to. Now, if you do keep going with it, there's obviously there's plenty still to be done always. Like I, I like to say that, you know, software is infinite and you can keep extending and upgrading and improving software as long as you can imagine new features that can be plugged into it, right? So. You know, there's no reason to stop if you want to keep coding and keep keep releasing updates. <clears throat> and uh, if people um, have issues for you, like if people log issues on GitHub, get back to them straight away. You know, thank them for their feedback and ask them for more feedback. You know, that, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to fix the bug or fix the issue. And you know, it may be it may not be something you think is in line with the project, or you know, it doesn't it doesn't benefit the community for the project just to implement this one thing for this one person. But, you know, responding to issues and, uh, you know, and fixing important bugs, it's all part of the process. And it's actually a really good experience, you know, for coding in a commercial environment because, uh, you know, when you join a, uh, a development team, a lot of the time you're just going to be fixing bugs, right? Like you're going to be fixing bugs on existing software. That's, that's the nature of the game. And uh, fixing bugs in your own open source project is good practice, good experience for that. <clears throat> um, Responding to issues can also be a good way to attract contributors. So uh, on numerous occasions, actually, I've, you know, I've um, had someone report a bug to me in one of my projects and, uh, and I turn it around on them and I say, you know, um, would you like to do the fix yourself? You know, like, you know, contribute some code and, and I'll accept the pull request. And this works, like um, I've, I've accepted quite a few uh, contributions to my own projects because someone comes along and says, hey, I've got an issue, can you fix it? And you say like, can you help with it? You know, it's your project too, basically. Um, you know, so it's a, good, it's a good way to get people on board. Responding to issues is a good way to get people on board, but keep doing whatever you need to do um, to get the word out, shout about it on social media, you know, talk about it at meetups. Um, if, you, if you make an open source project, come and talk about it at BrizJS um, and invite people to contribute. Invite people to come and, you know, make them feel welcome and uh, make them feel like their, their contributions could be accepted. Finally, um, you might want to create a website and some more sort of full documentation for it. You know, I've done this on a couple of my own projects. Um, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, you can host web pages like this for free on GitHub, usually under, um, under a docs folder, under the actual project itself. Uh, it's called GitHub Pages, so have a look at that. Uh, and you can generate um, API documentation from your code as well. Now, that's it's a bit tricky to set up. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, so I wouldn't don't don't jump into that too too soon because you'll spend more time writing documentation and tuning your web your web page for your, for your for your open source project than you will working on the open source project if you're not careful. Um, so this this shouldn't be the the, the full on website and documentation shouldn't be one of the first things you do. Um, I do have an example to show you. I find it. So I made this library called the plot library. 
Sorry, I'm just trying to work on Zoom controls again here. Um, or you can, you can find this on, um, on GitHub under Dataforge Notebook, the plot library. So it's, it's a simple abstraction over an existing plot library, um, but designed for simplicity and, and you know, a forgiving nature so that um, you, know, you can easily get into it. Uh, but under the, uh, under the docs directory here, so I've got doc source, that's, that's the actual you know, source for the actual web, static web page that gets built for the documentation. And then the docs itself is under the docs directory. This is a, a GitHub convention. So you basically put a static web page under the docs directory. You can see all the compiled JavaScript there. There's a whole mess of stuff here. Um, the, in, the main index file. And then what that looks like, um, like actually this, this is the live version of that, um, of that web page. And this is generated by a software called um, DocuSaurus down here. Um, I'll put them up the link down there, DocuSaurus. Um, I think it was created by the people at Facebook. It's pretty cool. I haven't, I haven't even like looked into really customizing this. So this is the default um, like color theme and all, and all that that actually DocuSaurus creates for you. And then um, I'm using, um, I used to use, well, I can't remember what it was that I used to use, but it was, it was a bit crap anyway. So I don't want to recommend that. But now what I'm using is um, tools from Microsoft called, let me have a look at the package to Jason to remind myself what they're called. Uh, well, it's not in there actually. What do I want to look? Here we go. If I just go back up to the root directory of the plot library, and we look at the package JSON here, you'll see that there's some commands in here for building the docs. Like, so I normally just run this one, this docs command, and that does a whole bunch of crap basically to generate the documentation. But essentially what it's doing is it's using, um, where is it? I might actually have to look at a package because there's a bunch of like nested packages in this. It's quite a, it's quite a complicated structure for a package. Uh, we go down to the package JSON from one of these and can hopefully show you what I'm talking about. Yeah, so um, the generation for docs for this particular sub package, it runs TypeScript to actually generate code, the JavaScript code. It runs this thing called um, API extractor, which basically generates um, I can't remember the, the order of things here, but um, it generates like at least JSON files that, that, that basically encapsulate all your comments and all the all the all the all the good info that it's extracted from the code. And then on top of that, there's another thing somewhere here. Uh, I won't bother finding it, but um, you can look at the code yourself or hit me up on Twitter later if you want to find out more about this sort of stuff. Um, there's another tool that you run then to kind of splice all the docs for all the packages together into like markdown files. And then from there, you run um, the DocuSaurus static site generator. And that's where you end up with a static side like this. But underneath that, actually, let me start again. Underneath that is the API docs. So this kind of lists um, all the packages and any examples that you've got uh, marked up in the code. It just pulls them out and kind of formats them quite nicely. And you know, it's got all the interfaces and it's, it's all linked together, so you can kind of follow around and see what's happening. So this is the kind of thing that you you don't want to do straight away when you're getting into the open source project because you can sink a lot of time into configuring and learning out how to how to build documentation like this. But it's it's really worthwhile if you you know if you've ramped up on a project and you've, you've got a community around it and you know people are asking you how to use it and stuff like that you can point them at the docs. <clears throat> cool. So uh, just to wrap up, anyway, just the list again of things to do to start your own project: choose a name, create your initial project, create a local code repository, do some coding, push it to GitHub. You know it's open source at that stage. Work on your docs. Keep coding and publish it, and then just iterate. Keep coding, publish it. Keep coding, publish it. All right, that's about all I've got for you. Uh, if you want to grab a copy of my book, there's a link there, and there's a discount code. I, that's a discount code for forty percent off. If you can't wait, uh, if you can wait a month um, for the next time I'm talking, I'm going to be giving away some copies for free. But uh, in the meantime, if you can't wait, uh, please feel free to to make use of that discount. Thank you for listening. Generous discount. Thanks so much. That's been a fantastic talk. And we definitely do still have a couple of questions that we can go through. Um, so I'll, I'll just take it from the top. Uh, what are some ways to really ensure that I'm, what I'm trying to do doesn't already exist? I might not see it in NPM or <laughs> GitHub, but it might still be out there. Uh, I yeah, guess, I well, mean, like you were showing, you're doing like an NPM search there. So what if well, it still exists? It, I mean, there's not much that isn't on Google these days, right? So 
Google is the place to go to, to look to see if something already exists because, you know, you, you might not believe this if you've only come on the scene really, recently, but GitHub isn't the only place to do um, open source coding. So there's Bitbucket, SourceForge, um, you know, there's, there's been a bunch of places. I used to do coding on um, Code Project, if anyone remembers that. Yeah. Um, there's a bunch of places to look to see if stuff exists, but usually, you know, you can just get to all that through Google. Sometimes it's just uh, a matter of knowing what to look for. Like the thing that you think you want to create, like it might have a different name to other people. So, I mean, the only way that you, you can figure out, um, you know, what other people call the thing is that you want to make is just by doing research and, and just, you know, following a thread of uh, leads basically to find that out. But, but yeah, certainly um, if, you're, if you're trying to get a, like uh, something on JavaScript out there, the first place to search is NPM. Absolutely. Yes. But, but also, uh, don't, does it frown <laughs> upon to have? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, don't don't be afraid to to re-implement a project. Like, you know, like I said in that talk last year, reinventing the wheel. It, it's perfectly okay to to redo a project if you want to do that for learning, um, or if you've just got some burning desire to like you think you can improve on on what already exists. Um, you know, at, at worst, you're only wasting your own time by making something that you know, already exists. So just go ahead and do it. <laughs> no such thing as a waste of time. Um, yeah, so is it frowned upon to have a private repo first, stabilize and then make the repo public once confident? That's the question. Uh, you know, there's no wrong way to do this. Like um, I've done that before. Like I think my first open source project, um, you know, going back to you know, about 2011 or something like that. I, I sat on that for a few years before I open sourced it. It wasn't meant to be open sourced originally. I mean, that's that's really why. Um, and I, I and then I got to the point where, I, like, you know, I sort of I thought I think I'd hope to make a business out of it, but you know, I, I, I'm a lot more business minded now than I used to be then. But then I didn't have a clue, so I just I was just sitting behind my computer and coding, and I made something that was interesting, and I ended up open sourcing it. But I, I would say now uh, to anyone who's listening. Um, if you if you make if you have the intention of open sourcing it, just do it as soon as you can. Like like, don't procrastinate, don't sit on it. Um, you know, like look, it, it could be a case that you're in the same situation and you think you keep it private. Um, I mean, don't don't keep it private just because you want to perfect it. That's never going to happen. Um, it just needs to be good enough um, to to go out there and, and do that early. Do that early and show how you work. Show show your process. Um, but if, if you think you're sitting on a business idea, you want to keep it private, and then you decide to open source later. I mean, do it. Do it however you want to do it. There's no. There's no right or wrong. Makes perfect sense. Good advice there. Uh, I think this is back to the answer we previously had. Uh, people clashing on names. Uh, should I be looking at other la oh. other languages pack package search tools to make sure I'm unique? So go, I guess, and so like. There's different ways you can do this. And I think um, GitHub has a package manager you can use as well. Um, mm. You know, obviously you can make, if it wasn't going to be open source, you could have a private NPM registry. Um, you can also put an organization name. I've had to do this on a couple of occasions, put an organization name. It's like, you know, at organization slash um, the project name. So if you've got name clashes, you can you can make up your own organization. Like I've got um, code capers. So I, I, I made an open source project a year ago, something like that. The dependency injection. I wanted to call it Fusion. Fusion was taken, so I called the project uh, at Code Capers slash Fusion. So you know, it's it's it doesn't really matter. Like it doesn't really matter what the name is, right? Um, and uh, uh, also, like I, I have actually taken names that people were squatting on, like on two or three occasions now. So if you see a name on on npm that you like, um, oh, they're changing the rules on this, by the way. So um, state. If you do want to do this, you're going to have to wait at the moment and you have to stay tuned to see what the new rules are. But that only, that only came about like in the last month. Before that, like you could basically contact NPM support on, on their support email or, or log, log, log an issue on the NPM website. And, and then um, when they reply to you, then you, if you can find the, um, the package maintainer's email, you can CC them on them and say, like, you know, you haven't published this in 10 years, whatever. And like there, are, there is stuff out there that is like really old, like, just, I, I got one just a couple of months ago that had been published for seven years, right? And, um, you know, sometimes the owners never get back to you because they don't have the email or the account or anything anymore. Sometimes they, like this guy that I got the package off um, last time, he got back to me and said, oh, I completely forgot that I had that and said it's, it's completely okay that you can have that name. 
So normally what will happen is if, if, if the package maintainer gives up the name, it's yours. Um, otherwise, if they don't respond or, you know, if, if they're not using it, then the NPM support team would basically just, um, you know, take, take it off them and give it to you. So it takes some time. You know, it takes like six to eight weeks to, to fully go through that process, which isn't long really if, you, if you're going to get a good name out of it. Um, but then, you know, obviously, you know, you shouldn't squat on that name as well. Like you shouldn't, you shouldn't squat on that name and not doing it with it. You should obviously put a, put a good open source project on it and then keep updating it, um, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> um, this one's an interesting question. Um, is Creative Commons popular in the open source code project world? Uh, so I think that's in reference to the fact that you were looking at different license types there as well. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a legal guy. <laughs> uh, I, I used to use, well, back when I, when I was on um, Code Project and, and doing projects on there, I used to just use the, the Code Project open, li open license until someone pointed out to me that there were some restrictions with that on how they could and couldn't use it. And they asked me if I could relicense using MIT. And this was, I mean, this could have been 10 years ago. It was a long time ago. And, uh, and so since then, I've been using MIT because it's just a real short license, um, no restrictions. It sort of indemnifies you. It says that if someone uses your code in a way that it wasn't intended to be used and that causes harm, then it's, you know, they can't hold me liable as the author of that code. Um, it just gives people, you know, free reign to do what they want with the code as long as they, you know, accept whatever repercussions come from that. Uh, and then, um, and I've just been using that without thinking about it really for a long time. And then um, I, I, I only really just, I always just go through the process of creating a new project if I use that npm init dash y, and um, and I just change isc to mit. But when I actually before I was doing this, uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I thought like, what's the isc license all about? I didn't, I didn't even know. But I, then I went and had a look, and you know, um, I had a look on um, Wikipedia, and it basically just seems to be a simplified version of mit. So it's it's not much different to what I'm using, and I'm probably actually just going to start using that in the future because that's that's the default for, for GitHub now. Cool. So I guess it's like, you know, your mileage may vary a little bit. Go, go have a look at your intent and purposes. Yeah, that's it. Everyone needs to look at how they, you know, what they want to do with it and you know, what they want to achieve out of the license. Uh, and obviously, if you're working for a company and they're letting you do open source, which is a really you know, privileged position to be in, I think. Uh, but if, if you're in that situation, obviously, you've got any license you want to use, you've got to run it by you know, the legal department in your company. And, uh, you know, depending on who your company is and how much red tape there is, that could take some time. But um, obviously, you, you can't just go ahead and pick whatever your license you want. You know, if, if you're representing your company and doing open source coding, you have to kind of go with what the company wants. And even if you're doing your open source projects, but you, uh, you, you're a soft, career software developer, you may have, um, you know, things in your contract that say that everything belongs to the company. So you, you always have to get an, uh, an open source contribution clearance from your company before mm -hmm. you start a new open source project. So it's worth... We're thinking about um, so, if, if something to be of, uh... something to be aware of for sure. I mean, I always, um, you know, I always made a lot of times um, not just open source coding, but you know, I, I never really wanted to kind of have a company that I worked for interfere with my side projects, or, or you know, I, I I give a lot to companies that I work for, but also you know, I want you know, I want my own kind of clear space to be able to do my own stuff. And I, and I always, you know, take care to make sure that it's not in any kind of competitive interest to the company or anything like that. So, but, you know, when, when you're going for a job interview, you can ask about that. You, you can, you know, straightforward, yeah. like say like, or, you know, even better, you've got projects out there because you didn't procrastinate. You got your open source. You didn't sit on your private um, open source project for years or whatever, like I used to do. Um, you've got it out in the open already. So you can say that's there, you know, if you want to accept me into your company, you have to accept that I'm working on this kind of thing. Like, and, and that you hiring me is, you know, is akin to like allowing me to continue doing that. So it's, you know, part of the conditions of joining a company um, that you'd be allowed to do. Not, 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 on, not, not on company time, of course. I'm not saying that you just go and work on company time. It's always on your own time, uh, you know, unless you have working for a company that have a, has a specific um, policy around that. Mm. And it's usually something that's looked upon really favourable. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure that, that that kind of thing is encouraged wherever possible as well. Yeah, um, I, Somebody I just it... wrote in to say congratulations on the open sourcing. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> it's, it's not a huge event to me because it's only, it's only a tiny little open source project uh, and, I've, and I've, I've done a 
you know, a couple of hundred of these by now. But, um, you know, for, for anyone else, like open sourcing your first tiny project, it could be, you know, it could be a huge event. Obviously, you know, you're probably a little bit worried that people are going to be looking at your code and what are they going to be thinking. And But, you know, don't worry about it. Just get it out there and, you know. Um, or everyone's code is dodgy. Everyone's code is dodgy in some way, so you know. You know, yep, you probably if, 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 if you're caring about that sort of thing, you're probably doing better than most. <laughs> that's a really good point to consider. Uh, there's one one point here. Uh, I, I think this is good actually. Can you automate dependency security updates for your package? So I guess it, in your um, in the approach of trying to reduce your maintenance overhead of being an open source maintainer. Uh, is there anything you can do to try and make sure that, you know, if you're, you, you've got all downstream dependencies, is that upstream dependencies, upstream dependencies, uh, to uh, make sure that you're consuming all the security updates and that you're not passing on any existing well, to vulnerabilities. A, to a certain extent, GitHub already does that. So it, it you know, it, it I, don't, I don't know how it works. I don't know how they do that magic, but it, it kind of tells you, it, it submits, submits pull requests uh, for things that you need to update. And then, you know, every so often when you're working on a project, you, know, you should update, obviously, your versions. Um, you can use um, npm outdated command and um, npm update to help you do that. I don't suggest um, updating all, everything at once, though. Like, it's much better. Uh, it's, not, it's not too bad if it's a small project, but if it's a big project that's been around for a while and you want to update dependencies, just make sure you do them one at a time and that you test up for each one. Otherwise, you can get yourself, like, in a hell of a mess with things not working anymore. Um, um, but, you know, like if, if you have a continuous delivery pipeline for your project, like I do for, um, I've got an open source project. Um, I open sourced my, um, my sort of my authentication backend as a microservice um, a couple of months back. And I've got that set up on GitHub. It's, you know, um, I've got GitHub Actions set up for the CD pipeline. When you commit code to that, it runs the uh, full set of automated tests. Um, it, it could easily run some sort of, you know, security checks to, to kind of, you know, test for, you know, what's in the dependencies, whether they need to be updated. I, di I didn't do that, to be honest. I never even really thought about doing that. But you, you could put that in as part of your CD pipeline that, you know, if there is some known security vulnerability that you, you blow up the build and, you know, you get an email that, you know, something something needs to be looked at. Um, at the moment, I just uh, I just have that running through the tests, doing a Docker build and then pushing, a, you know, a new Docker image up to, to Docker Hub. But you, if, you, if you've got automated builds... You can do anything like that, like anything you can think of, like convention testing is a good one that I've heard of. Um, like um, you probably do something with like load testing, like what um, Andre was talking about to kind of, you know, stress test your your code if you wanted to. Mm. Yeah, and, and there's uh, like, you can run the NPM audit command and that will try and oh, tell yeah. you about all the different upstream vulnerabilities. So that's definitely something that's worth worth doing and making sure that's part of your pre-deploy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, like we... Would that, you that, highlighted that that's going to be part of part two of this talk which is how to continue and maintain your open source project <laughs> absolutely <laughs> launching that's that's great you know afterwards that's that's all the work of maintenance that's absolutely true <laughs> fantastic and that's through all the questions uh you know cool. folks out there watching at home um please make sure you enter the um for the uh the quokka license as well uh make sure we get some more answers in there uh, but thank you, Ashley. That was fantastic. That was so cool. good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I'll put the slides online later. So, you know, if you missed out on the discount code, um, we'll, we'll make that available anyway. So, Wonderful. <laughs> cool. And congratulations Thanks. again on the new book. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs> awesome. All right.